When we're little, we are all told fantastical stories and fairy tales. Um, and whereas most children have uh, fairy tales and stories featuring heroes like Paul Bunyan and Huckleberry Finn and Prince Valiant, my childhood stories featured a hero named Jeff Dahlman. Jeff Dahlman was my father's childhood best friend. They grew up together in Wisconsin. He was this elusive, larger-than-life character whom I'd never met but had been described to me as, you know, a round-faced, rascally, uh, bespectacled man with a grin forever tattooed on his face and an impish twinkle in his eye. Once upon a time, uh, the day of my parents' wedding, Jeff snuck out of the church to attach a set of moose uh, antlers to the front of the honeymoon vehicle. And a couple hours down the road, after they had both accused each other of the disgusting stench that was growing inside of the car, they realized that he had hidden a block of Limburger cheese below the front seat. Um, one time, on a fishing trip in Canada, Jeff wolfed down so many blueberries that the next day found himself you know, a couple miles out from shore fishing and was attacked by the worst case of diarrhea he'd ever experienced only to find himself kind of up a shit creek of his own making. Um, and, and then one time, he and you know, Jeff Dahlman and my dad and a couple of their buddies decided to drive an old beat up station wagon from Wisconsin to Mexico to watch a donkey show. Now a donkey show, I don't know if you know, takes place in you know, a local bar, perhaps someone's hacienda, um, and it features a bow-legged woman from town fornicating with a donkey. I never said that these were kids' stories. Um, so soon after their college graduation, uh, my dad took a job in Alabama, and Jeff moved to the fishing and hunting mecca of Alaska. And it was then that they decided they were going to begin planning an Alaskan fishing trip that would rival every you know, adventure they'd taken up until that point. And it would happen as soon as they were financially stable. Well, my dad had three kids, so financially stable meant it's going to have to wait until the kids are put through college. And I'll never forget a day last May when my brother, my sister, my mom and dad and I gathered to watch my baby brother receive his diploma. After graduation, we went to a park and I found myself sitting alone with my dad in the grass, the sun shining down on us, and he let out an almost inaudible sigh. And I turned to him, I go, what? And he goes, I, I did it. I did it, you, I'm done. You guys are, you're all your own people. And we continued talking in the grass and I kind of convinced him to really, you know, start planning for this Alaskan fishing trip. It was time, he was done. Um, I came back to New York and went back to rehearsal for a play that I was starring in. It was a multimedia play called Hospital. And uh, the star of the show, myself, was a comatose patient, dying. Um, and I called my dad, and I was, I was really excited to tell him. I was like, Dad, you won't believe it. Okay, so yesterday we spent the entire day in the wing of a hospital out on Roosevelt Island, and I walked around all day in a backless Johnny, and then they, they put me in a hospital bed and hooked me up to an actual ventilator, and then I filmed my death scene. And he was, so, he was so enamored by like the life I was living. And, and uh, he said, you know, all right now, listen, baby cakes, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, I'm gonna come see the play the second week. That still works, right? He's like, yeah, that totally works. Okay, so I'm gonna come see the play the second week. And then, now I haven't talked to Jeff about this yet, but I'm gonna buy that ticket to Alaska and I'm just gonna fly out from New York. And I was so excited and we ended that conversation the same way we always do. Um, I love you, daddy -o. Oh, baby cakes, I love you. And three days later, my father died unexpectedly um, in a hospital bed wearing only a backless Johnny attached to a ventilator. What had started as uh, a stomach ache and went misdiagnosed and was ignored by a physician uh, turned out was acute pancreatitis, followed by heart failure. Um, 
after the longest flight of my life. I landed in Alabama and kind of geared myself up for what was long, going to be the longest week of my life. And now my, my parents had divorced a couple years prior. So, and my father had no will. Um, he was 54. So all of the decision making for the funeral and, and the whole process was left to my brother, my sister and I. And in, in death, it seems, there are more questions than in life. And not just like philosophical questions, I'm talking questions that need immediate answers. And, and in my case, these questions were being asked by this beautiful, kind, southern funeral home director named Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson had short cropped brown hair with a receding hairline and um, you know, kind of soft, really heavy shoulders and kind, kind of sad, heavy eyes. Now, uh, y'all, um, which, uh, which hospital is your father at? You know, we're gonna, we'll be in charge, we'll make sure the body gets from the hospital to the funeral home, but uh, we'll, y'all are gonna need to have to call up first and let them know that we'll be picking up the body. And now, do y'all want him uh, cremated or buried? Okay, do you want, uh, y'all, check that off. Do y'all want him uh, in, a, in a rental casket or one of them caskets that can burn with him? Okay. Now, y'all got a lot of kin coming in from Wisconsin, I know, so um, do y'all want, I'm sure, because they haven't seen him in a couple of years, y'all are going to want an open casket <coughs> to wake, right? Uh, so, um, listen, we, uh, we need to know what to put your father in, so you're going to have to pick out some clothing. And uh, do you want him wearing his glasses? And do, do, do you want him clean shaven? And Brittany, I'm sorry to bother you about this, but y'all left the funeral home and forgot to leave behind a pair of underwear. We're going to need you to bring those back right away so we can start dressing him. So my siblings and I decided he's going to wear clean white underwear. Um, yes, he will be clean shaven. And after hours of, of rifling through his clothing, we decided on a clean white undershirt, um, a, white, a, white, a light button-up short-sleeved linen plaid shirt. It was blue and purple plaid, and he used to wear it, and we remembered it from our childhoods. And since he couldn't really wear a T-shirt at his own wake, we decided, okay, we'll cover that up with a really nice um, kind of wool, cotton, blend, blue v-neck sweater. And then we decided, well, he loved that sweater we got him for Christmas two years ago and wore it every time we were home. And it's this heavy wool kind of gray toggle, kind of toggle button-up sweater. So we put that on him and we thought, okay, white knit socks and those moccasins that mom bought him on their wedding day, who wore those. And then, but the rental coffin was this disgusting, hideous, yellow, papery interior. So we thought, why don't we, why don't we line the inside of the coffin with that quilt that great grandma made dad that's made of all of his childhood clothes. So we lined the quilt with that. And so from the waist down, my dad was covered in the clothing from his childhood. Um, so at the wake, we're standing kind of, and you're, you stand in almost what is like a wedding receiving line. Um, it's the children first, and then the siblings of the deceased, and then in my dad's case, his parents. Um, so we're standing, taking people in, and at a wake, everyone wants to say something to you, and everyone has the same thing to say. You know, God only takes the best, and it was God's will. And you know, God won't, he, he's, not gonna, he's not gonna give you something that's harder than you can handle. And at that moment, I snap, and I, I, I become suddenly very aware of my surroundings for the first time since, the, since that week had begun. And I can feel the sweat pooling at kind of the small of my back, and I, and I can feel it forming in the dent underneath my lips. And I feel the tears that have welled up on my collarbone, and, and my temples are throbbing, and I look down and I can see the sandals on my feet, and as I see the sandals on my feet, I notice the flip-flops of all of the people around me, and I notice the women in linen clothing, light linen clothing, and then and I can hear sweaty thighs disattaching themselves from the leather parlor seats, and, and I look around and everyone's sweating, and everyone's drinking water. There is so much water in this funeral home and why is everyone sweating and he is fanning himself with an obituary and then I turn around and as I'm turning around to face the casket to face my father my siblings are turning at the same time we're in Alabama it is July it is 105 degrees outside 
We turn around to look at my father, who is dressed in four layers of clothing, <laughs> wearing knit socks and insulated slippers, and swaddled like a sardine in a winter quilt. And it was at that moment that the three of us erupted in laughter because we'd realized we had inadvertently packed our father for his Alaskan fishing trip. So a couple hours go by and we're standing at the wake and we've, you know, greeted everyone and you're kind of in that robotic mode and an old family friend is talking to me and she's got her sweaty palm on my shoulder. She's reminding me of memories of, you know, my dad and it's been about 10 minutes and I don't have the heart to tell her, you know, you've reached the limit of um, you know, enough memory shared with one grieving child. You need to kind of move on. So continue to let her talk. And I notice behind her, there's a couple standing. And they're standing arm in arm. And they're silent. And their heads are facing the ground. And I realize they've been standing there for a little while. Um, I don't recognize them. I think maybe they're friends of dad's from church. Or maybe they were just strangers in passing. He helped one time. Um, I let them family friend continue talking. About five minutes later, she shuffles off to nag my brother and sister. And when I look back up, the couple's still standing exactly where I'd left them. Silent, arm in arm, heads down. And then it happened. The woman unclasps her arm and steps aside. And the man takes two long, heavy steps forward and he reaches out his hand and he lifts his head and his twinkly eyes meet mine. And he says, Brittany, Jeff Dorman. And I, gr I grabbed hold of him so hard. And I, I, I don't know how, how to explain the moment. Um, he, Jeff Dorman stepped out of my storybook that day. He was no longer a myth. He was no longer this figure of my father's memory. He was real. And I, and, and I was holding him. And my, my holding him was like being introduced to my father's childhood and cradling it in my arms. Jeff Dahlman, I have, <clears throat> I have so many memories of my father and they've become all the richer and all the more real because I finally know Jeff Dahlman. Thank you.